and especially if this is going to be actually used by students. And a bit of introductory information about some of the formats and materials of Chinese painting. So I'd start off with this. This is a little diagram that shows some of the basic common formats for Chinese painting. And the basic medium for painting would be paper and silk. So I have students in class who commonly say, canvas, canvas, you know, no canvas, it's silk or paper, and paper is a little bit later in usage. And they have different uh, connotations and values, silk being expensive, fancy, usually for formal kinds of paintings, for ceremonial painting, for ritual images. Um, paper starts to be used by, by artists, um, so-called amateur artists in the 10th, 11th centuries. Paper is less formal, it's inexpensive, it's less about the craftsmanship and skill needed to paint on silk, which is not easy to paint on. But in these formats, let's see if I'm just doing this manually, uh, this is one of the most popular formats, a hanging scroll. It's a vertical rectangular format. You see the image in the middle. I'll show you an example of it presently. And then uh, the hand scroll, again, a scroll format. You can roll it up a horizontal. And then later on in the history of Chinese painting, we find other smaller, more intimate formats, album leaves, where you have a small image or uh, combined with an inscription that's mounted on board. You can mount them in a dual fold or accordion fold fashion. And then the Chinese fan, the earlier Chinese fan is a circular fan mounted on a stick. The folding fan is quite a bit later. It was the 14th, 15th century format later. So just a diagram showing a hanging scroll in its various parts and we don't worry about the numbers. The black rectangle there is a, uh, in the case where the image <coughs> would be mounted. We don't usually say frame, we say mounted. We mount the painting onto a scroll. And it is indeed a scroll, so at the very bottom is a roller that acts as the, the center of the scroll, the, the core of the scroll. But also when you're displaying a hanging scroll, because you hang them up and you leave them out, um, it, it functions as a weight to keep the scroll hanging relatively straight. And up at the top is a cord tied to a half dial, and you can hang, where you can hang the scroll. Here's an example of a small one. It's actually a Chinese painting, but it, it belongs to a Japanese Zen temple in Kyoto, the Daitokuchi. But it's a small image, and it's a small, very intimate, uh, scaled uh, hanging scroll, so the image is in paper and ink. And it's mounted in the middle of the scroll, you see, hanging scroll folded. Now, scrolls, hanging scrolls are, are the advantage to them is that you can leave the painting on display, but when you're finished, you need to change the painting. You can actually simply roll it up. Uh, if you have a box for it, put it in a box and you put it on a shelf. And one of the things I tell, you know, tell art students is like, can you do this with oil paintings? You generally don't do this in the European oil painting tradition. But the idea is that the painting stays out. Um, and um, if you meet collectors that have a huge collection of oil paintings, I was a graduate student helped um, a woman, some of us helped her in the John Hancock building, she was doing her, every decade she would have walls washed and she had all these paintings. And, we were taking millions of dollars worth of paintings and leaning against the wall in the walking corridor outside our Hancock apartment. Um, you, you, know, you can't roll them up. Um, painting students will take their canvas painters off of stretchers and then roll them up to store them. So this is actually really convenient for changing out your paintings. And that's very much part of the, I think, significance of the scroll format is that it's occasional, right? It's real suited to adaptability, to need to change the paintings that you have out for different sorts of occasions, particularly particular social occasions or seasonal, uh, particularly seasonal festivals and holidays. So it's adaptable to this kind of, in a sense, the coordination of human culture with the culture of nature, as I understand it in Chinese art. Here's a hanging a hand scroll. Same sort of thing. It has a dowel at the at the uh, uh, left end, the back end. You would read. You would open the scroll at the front end, which is the right side. And so following the traditional format for writing, Chinese would be written vertically in columns and you would read from top to bottom and you would read from right to left. Now paintings are also pretty much in the hanging scroll horizontal rectangular format viewed from right to left. And the black rectangle that you see here that's split in the middle would be where the image would be mounted and hand scrolls can be very long. An example I'm going to show you here is very short. It's a very small scroll and it's one image. You can actually open up the scroll and see the entire image. It has actually added pieces of paper in the mounting, uh, which have other inscri inscriptions added to it. Um, I have seen some uh, imperial scrolls that are quite long, 70 feet long. <coughs> it's on 18th century. And the hand scroll is supposed to be an intimate format. Um, it's, it's not meant for leaving out on display. So if you go to the Museum of Fine Arts, they have a fine collection of Chinese paintings, actually one of the best. 
and they have hand scrolls. Um, they believe they have one famous uh, uh, Wayzun period hand scroll out of uh, court ladies preparing uh, silk. Um, but you would never leave it out on display the way it would be displayed in a museum. So they have special cases so that you can unroll at least uh, four long scrolls, a section of the <coughs> scroll at a time. But basically, the way they're viewed is if you want to view a hand scroll, you have to take it out and look at it, and then you put it back. It's never left out on display. So they're meant and they're intended for occasional viewing. And you would view it from right to left. And so if we had a long hand scroll, maybe say 10 feet, or maybe 15 feet, or 20 feet, uh, some imperial scrolls are 70 feet. Uh, you would unroll it from right to left, viewing it section at a time. So you'd look at one section, roll it up, and move on to the next section. You can go back and forth, but basically, paintings in this format tend to, in, uh, painters instinctively know about how much you're going to see it at, at any one time. They'll kind of scale you know, the fade outs, so to speak, the narrative, according to how much you're going to see it and how much they're thinking you're going to see it as you unroll the scroll. Uh, when you finish, then you roll the whole thing up and you put it away. The format is usually small, you know, from typically from the bottom to the top, maybe uh, 12 inches. A large one would be 18 inches. So you can't have a large group of people sometimes. I've gone with students to the museum, and we're looking at a hand scroll. Only a few students can view them at a time because they're just too small. So it's really intended for occasional and for intimate viewing, for those kinds of social occasions. And the format is then chosen for that sort of intimacy uh, for viewing. There are also other kinds of formats. The screen, and this is a detail of a large hanging scroll, um, and it's a, in a garden setting. Here's this well, well-to-do, would-be literatus, um, probably a, just a wealthy landholder. Um, but he's seated in his garden with a flat screen behind him. So there were lots of paintings that were done on screens, or for screens, but most of, them, most of those don't survive because they're pieces of furniture. So lots of painting for screens. There's also wall painting painting on, in this case, uh, Buddhist site, uh, cave temples. So painting on uh, cave walls or painting on the large wooden surfaces of Buddhist temples in the early centers. So lots of the wall painting that would serve its religious functions. Here's also a wall painting, a detailed wall painting of a huge Buddhist paradise. This is Amitabha in the Pure Land. Uh, so formats of painting. So, this, the, what I'm going to be showing you and talking about this afternoon, this first part of it, my talk, will be hanging scrolls for the most part, and maybe occasionally a hand scroll. But paintings on silk, maybe an occasional painting on paper. This is ink and some color on paper, but I'm bringing this, it's a, one section of a hand <coughs> scroll, and I'm bringing it because of these things that are at the top, which if you show any slides, students are going to ask you, what is all of that? You know, what are the red marks on it? The red marks in various shapes are seals, and these are seal impressions of collectors. So it was appropriate if you were a collector and you owned a painting, you could mark and index your ownership by pressing the seal on the painting. Um, in this painting, there are some large prominent seals. This one, for example, and this one, and this one. These are all the same emperor. This is the 18th century Chenling Emperor's seals. He fancied himself quite a connoisseur and collector of Chinese calligraphy and painting. And so he would impress the seals. In fact, he had such a large collection, sometimes he would invite ministers to put his seal on, it, on the paintings for him. And multiple seals, and oftentimes large, large, perhaps they're awkward seals. <laughs> and also inscriptions. It was considered particularly starting in the 12th century and then on. You find artists, but also artists associates, and also um, uh, members of the imperial family adding inscriptions to paintings. That are, Commentaries. Peter mentioned commentary, the commentarial tradition in Chinese, uh, Chinese thought and history. You find that commentarial tradition applying in the visual arts of painting and calligraphy as well. In paintings, you'd have a hand scroll or a hanging scroll, and a space would be, you'd see a space, and you might add your, your commentarial inscription onto it, as well as your imperial seals. There are also artist seals. So artists would sign their paintings, maybe pen their own inscriptions. This painting, though not in this detail, has a lengthy inscription uh, by the artist. It's actually not a poem. It's actually a narrative that explains why the artist made the painting and how it's dedicated to a friend of his and the artist as, as a gift. And so it also has the artist seals. So seals of ownership and inscriptions that are commentaries by artists or, and or um, uh, artist associates or collectors generations later. Um, now there is 
an unspoken kind of sense of taste, you know, where you put your seals. And you can, you know, ruin paintings by putting your seals in the wrong spot. The Qianlong Emperor, by the way, uh, had entered into his collection at one point a painting, a landscape painting by a really famous 14th century artist. And he, he loved the painting. It had quite a reputation historically. And so he wrote inscriptions on them, seals all over it. Then another version of the same painting came into the collection, and he looked at it and says, well, this is a copy. And so he wrote one inscription and put a couple seals on it, and that was that. Unfortunately, he was wrong. Well, fortunately, he was wrong. Uh, the copy, he thought was, what he thought was a copy was actually the original. And so the original is relatively uh, clean. So seals, these are seals of the artist. The artist actually who did this painting. He's been extracted from examples of his, surviving examples of his calligraphy and also from some of his paintings. Um, these are his name, or one of his names. All right, so this is a little bit of background material um, leading us into talking about landscape painting. And this is the term that we're translating in as landscape. I'm not sure where the, uh, where's my English? Landscape painting has all sorts of associations for us, and certainly in the art school context. You know, they, my students would envision going out into the fields and setting up their easels and painting directly from what they saw or sketching it and then going back to the studio and painting what they saw. And so landscape painting is this broad category, paintings are images of nature. Um, whatever you happen to see, they could be somewhat imaginary, somewhat idealized, or just straight raw what it is you're looking at. In China, the term that we're translating as landscape is very specific. It literally means mountains and water, or mountain and water. It could be plural, it could be singular. Uh, it can be both simultaneously, interestingly enough. So this character starts out historically as a pictograph for a mountain and over here, a pictograph for flowing water. So we have to keep in mind that we're talking about Chinese landscape painting, we're talking about mountain and river painting, mountain and stream painting. You know, I would sort of facetiously say to students in Chicago, if you took your oil paints and your easels out to anywhere in Illinois, you could not do shop <laughs> right? you know, So no mountains there. So here's an example of the category of mountains and streams. In the Han Dynasty, it was found in the tomb of a, of a, of a Han Dynasty prince who died around about 113. BCE, and it was an incense burner, a cast bronze incense burner with gold inlay, and it's a depiction of mountainous islands, and basically there are also holes interspersed among the peats, so that when the incense is burning, the smoke would come up and swirl around it. This is mountains and water. It's actually understood to be a depiction of one of the legendary or mythological islands of immortal paradises off the, supposedly off the eastern coast of China, somewhere. So mountains and water. Uh, so when we get to landscape painting, mountains and water painting, mountains and river painting, um, one of the earliest, I think this is actually an authentic painting, the, the, the real tradition of this monumental um, art, the important tradition of landscape painting in Chinese, the history of Chinese painting, really begins about the 10th century. There are records from the Tang Dynasty that suggest that there might have been landscape paintings then, but it's not so clear exactly what those paintings are about or what they really are. But the earliest examples that we have that we call, okay, this is the beginnings of the monumental tradition of Chinese landscape painting, start about the, the 10th century and push on. And it becomes one of the most important subjects for Chinese painting. So in pre-modern China, just as we do in the West, we have a hierarchy of the fine arts. We have the fine arts versus what used to be called the minor arts. We don't call them the minor arts anymore. Now we call them the decorative arts. <laughs> so we have, we have the fine arts and we have the decorative <coughs> arts. And then somewhere on the bottom, although this is changing as design, um, <laughs> but uh, in in the fine arts, I mean, you, you, if you meet some art student, most likely and say, well, I'm studying art, and you get asked, or do you paint? You don't get asked, do you do sculpture? Uh, do you do printmaking? Uh, do you do installation art? Do you do photography? Photography is still a little bit tainted. Um, usually what comes to people's mind is painting is because historically painting has, has been on the top of the hierarchy of the fine arts of the West. In China, traditionally, the highest of the arts is poetry. Next was calligraphy. And then after calligraphy comes painting. And then starting in the 10th century and later on, and within painting, it's landscape painting. Interestingly enough, the formats of Chinese painting would seem to naturally favor storytelling, especially in the hand scroll format, storytelling. But um, in the course of the development of Chinese, the history of Chinese aesthetics, things that are more storytelling are considered very low on the hierarchy. And so if you have a dual landscape painting, but it has too much storytelling quality to it, it's considered lower on the hierarchy of 
the fine arts of painting. So what I'm going to do um, in, in this presentation, I'm going to focus on, because we're talking about culture, and I want to end up with talking about culture, and Peter starts to introduce uh, some of the things that I really want to focus on, in that traditions of pre-modern Chinese painting, landscape painting being an example, is we're about, it's about a mastery of patterns. Right? What people talk about was the Wen part of Wen Hua, culture. It's a mastery of patterns. Um, and so, so we're going to start with patterns. But the patterns, while they can seem, well, they are in fact, and they can seem highly prescriptive, are not really absolute rules. It's not a canon of judgment, um, like a Ten Commandments, where this is how you're going to paint. It may seem that way, and more conservative students of painting probably would adhere to what seem to be the rules and conventions of these inherited patterns. And the patterns get to the point where they seem sacrosanct. And so to, to, to violate them would be almost to violate all propriety and appropriateness. Um, but, but it's not just adherence to the patterns uh, that one learns through a master by copying old masters, by studying with a teacher. Teachers are really crucial. But it's the other part that's really crucial, and that's the harder part, and that's the improvisation on those patterns. So the analogy that I like to use is music. And certain kinds of music, particularly music that have an improvisatory tradition. Uh, for us now, jazz would be an example of that. And I would also argue the classical music. In the sense that jazz and classical music are sort of a parody now, in the sense they're a certain kind of they're, they're formal. You know, uh, they become almost museum-like in their, in their seriousness or how they're perceived uh, by, for their seriousness and high art character. But they both are improvisatory traditions that require mastery of patterns, mastery of discipline, and also require certain physical mastery. You can't improvise in jazz if you can't play the instrument, right? And when do you start? You start early, and it requires daily practice. It requires hours of practice. Classical music, just the same. It's interesting that both are taught at Juilliard. Um, then, but it's not just mastery of the physical technique of the instrument, you have to master traditions. There are traditions of improvisation, there are traditions of the Russian school of pianism. There's the French school, there's the Central European Germanic school, and then now there's the emerging Amerian school, and that's within classical music, for example. And then the jazz, you know, how many different sorts of threads of jazz traditions of improvisation, mm -hmm. styles, and so on and so forth. You have to learn those, and then once you master those, you have to get to the point where you forget them in order to be able to make music and improvise in the spontaneity of the moment. That's really what this tradition is. And that becomes what Wen Hua, what culture is, ideally, anyway. And what I'm going to try to argue is that what uh, landscape painting or painting in general, and calligraphy or poetry, as this kind of improvisation on mastery of sacrosanct patterns, is, is community. The whole point of this is to actually participate and contribute to a community. So, starting with what I'm going to try to do is show you very quickly, if I can go quickly, it's hard for me to go quickly sometimes, is to give you some introduction to familiarity, at least with the 10th and 11th century patterns, as best as we understand them, uh, with, with respect to composition and some, some motifs that show up. So this is painting, let's say it's 10th century. It's in the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City, Missouri, which, by the way, has an extremely fine, high quality collection of Chinese art. I mean, in, in the world, and it's amazing. So, a landscape that we attribute to this artist, Jing Hao. Um, there's a signature, sort of, but signatures are easily faked. Um, the title is a kind of a made up title, it's just a descriptive title. We don't really know what the real title might have been. It's painted in ink and lead white pigment on silk. There are a lot of holes in the silk. This is a big, huge hole. There are lots of holes, so it's really badly damaged. It has um, survived a lot of trouble. All right, so there's a picture of mountains, right? So we've got the mountain here. Um, one of the things that is, seems to be kind of pattern of practice for 10th and 11th century landscape painters is a juxtaposition, at least in the hand scroll, I mean hanging scroll format, of a large set of trees focusing on a cluster of maybe a handful of tall trees at the bottom of the painting with usually one best, slightly angled tree or a really gnarly tree. Oh, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. There are people. I just want to make sure that you see that they're tiny. <laughs> so there are people there. They're all ghostly white because the detail of the painting has fallen off. They just simply reflect off. So there's a cluster of people there. This is the bottom half of the painting there. Um, here's our rather ghostly in this black and white slide. But again, a lot of the pigment has flaked off of this old painting. These tall trees at the very bottom there. 
and then the summit. So one of the things we see in these paintings is in the vertical format, you see a oh, cluster of trees at the bottom, summit of the mountain at the top, and there's also a hierarchical re uh, uh, arrangement. Always one dominant mountain, or if there are cluster of peaks, one dominant peak. So um, this dominant mountain, what an 11th century painter has recorded in his notes, in his son's notes, he taught his son how to paint, and his son recorded notes. He says to his son, he says, make sure that you get the host mountain. Once you lay out the host mountain, you can lay out the other mountain peaks in, high, in order of size and of stature and so on and so forth. So, and then he talks about, then make sure you get the elder pine. And what we see in these paintings, earlier than the, already the 11th century, is here's the, our, our central mountain, our main mountain, our host mountain, the summit up at the top in the sky, and then the trees down here below. So this, we're gonna, I'll show you some other examples. We also see um, temple buildings, or pal palatial style architecture nestled in really precarious and out of the way places. I usually identify them as some kind of temple, what kind of temple, it's not always clear. Uh, but you know, here nestled in a gorge. So that becomes kind of a standard motif, I call them visual tropes, you might say, in um, 10th and 11th century landscape painting. All right, so where else are we going? Uh, more people. This is down here. So this is this really strange, marvelous, ghost of twisting, dragon-like tree. More people over here. One of the figures that actually shows up pretty readily, or commonly, in 10th and 11th century landscape paintings is this guy with a broad brimmed hat riding a mule. And I'll point them out in some other examples. On the lower left-hand corner, these folks. This looks like a child. So the mountain is populated with people going about their business. They have families, they're traveling, they're carrying goods, maybe they're merchants. Uh, down here as well, on the left side, these folks on a bridge. We come back to the whole painting. Now, all right, so. Tall trees, bed tree down at the bottom, our host mountain uh, summit at the top, following a vertical axis, dividing the painting into left half and right half. Ah, and then there's also an imaginary horizontal point where we divide the painting into top half and the bottom half. Now, on one side, it could be the left side, it could be the right side, we're going to find more densely packed mountain forms. And on the more densely packed side, the forms tend to be vertical. When we look to the opposite side, the space will be more open, and the forms will tend to be more horizontal. Again, it could be the left or the right side. Now, coming to these trees, there they are. And then here's the bent tree that's down below, just to sort of make this point again. And then there's our summit up at the top. One of the other qualities of this painting is this sinuous serpentine movement of the mountain up. Not all the paintings do that, or some do it in a more uh, rectilinear, zigzagging sort of fashion. Uh, but we do see this sense in these, this early period of the landscape painting tradition of movement, that is growth. We're moving from the earthly, watery, earthly realms, it's called, down below, up into the sky, the realm of the sky. But moving in this pattern, how do we get the sense of this movement? Is through a layering. So you have the mountains constructed of layers that overlap one another. And we build up a sequence of them, and they bounce back and forth off of each other, one over the next. And you create a rhythm of these layers in movement, turning with respect to each other, but also alternating in light and dark colors or tones. So you have this light and dark creating this pulse, along the, as well as the turning relationship of the different facets or planes of the rock forms. And that builds up and moves up till we get to the peak. So the mountain growing in this combination of F S curves. So you can see the layering here and then the alternation of the rhythmic light and dark contrast. So rhythmic sequence of overlapping forms and alternating light, light and dark tones. All right, so here's another painting, very likely a copy or in the tradition of 10th and 11th century landscape paintings. We don't really have any authentic paintings by this artist, we so only have texts that refer to him as being um, and really one of the most important painters of the 10th century, but unfortunately we don't have any of his landscapes. Guantong, Tong, uh, Travelers on a Mountain Pass is kind of like... <laughs> you should hear some of the other ringtones I get in class. Um, anyway, so, uh, but probably uh, 
giving us some sense. We don't have many paintings that survive, authentic paintings that survive from this period, but this seems to fit into the tradition as best as we can guess it. So what do we have in this landscape painting? Well, uh, vertical axis. It's not quite evenly left, right, left, right halves, but nevertheless, there is a division of the space on the right side. In this case, we have densely packed forms. They tend to be more or less vertical, but we also see on the right side, on the left side, sorry, right side, densely packed. On the right side, a left side. <laughs> yeah. Um, are, it's more open. You can travel up on the, on the left side, but the forms are more ver still vertical. So, so the, the, point, uh, the, the, the points, things I'm pointing out aren't absolute rules. They're the general sort of approach, or even, not even necessarily conscious patterns, something that may have been simply taught by teachers, or you know, just, just do this and not explain. And then they're modified, they're, they're changed according to personalities and according to circumstances on which perhaps we lost. But also the trees down here below juxtaposed against the summit. And this is the cloud-like head of the mountain at the top. And there are also, there's the top. And we're moving down from the top on a pathway in the middle of the painting. Ah, if you can make it out, these fancy buildings, palatial buildings tucked away up here in a gorge. Uh, the river flows down towards the lower part of the painting, so we have our mountains and streams. So it fits the categories of landscape painting. Down here below, some kind of evidence of a village with all kinds of activities going on. And there's, by the way, our fellow on the mule. Here. And then down here below, village life. Another example attributed to another, an 11th century painting in this particular case, Xu Daoming. Um, and if you look at the painting, let's see, I'm back up. There, maybe this is the most important mountain lying vertically. It's not along the central axis, although you can still divide the painting along the central axis. But this is a variation along the diagonal. So the open space here is on the right side, and the close-off space with the more vertical forms is on the left side. We still have, maybe this is our summit, our dominant peak, our host mountain, and then down below here are tall trees, and here's our bent tree. We throw in another good tree on the right side for good measure. Um, we zoom in a little bit. Here are the tall trees, and here's our bent tree. Oops, sorry, I wanted to point out temple buildings. Mm -hmm. Pathways, too. I'm, I'm not showing you everything so, for the sake of time, but there are pathways, footpaths, bridges, rickety bridges, fancy bridges. The notion of travel and wandering is an important theme in this early landscape painting tradition. Here's another one. Right, so, what do we have down here below? Oh, there's our cluster of trees with uh, bent trees, to be sure. And then up at the top, here's the temple buildings, or fancy palatial type buildings up uh, in the middle level here, surrounded by all this mist, nestled in a gorge. Here's our main mountain summit, right against the trees. Trees, mountain summit. And then densely packed vertical forms on the right side here, and open up slightly more horizontal forms on the left side. And a kind of a variation on our zigzag path up along the spine of the host mountain. Oh, I'm sorry, you know, I could keep going. You know, I'm just trying to give you the sense of how, <laughs> how intense this is. Um, and, but also how different the paintings are once you're familiar with the, the, the rhetoric. Uh, so uh, yeah, there's our temple buildings. And you can imagine, include, yeah, vertical axis. Oh, they tend to favor the right side. Pack up the right side, vertical forms. Oh, waterfalls are common also. Open up the left side here are horizontal. Zigzag. Ah, sorry, Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City. And we have a vertical form. And then one of the other things that we start to notice, and I didn't point it out with the other paintings, but they do this too, is, oops, went too fast. Forms along the margins, left and right side, tend to angle up towards the center and point up towards the mountain peak. Uh, along the vertical axis, all the way up to the summit. So we have our hierarchy here, our host mountain. Which side is more open? It's more ambiguous in this particular composition, but I tend to think one wanders into the space on the left side and comes out among the more slightly more dense vertical forms on the right side. This painting, where are the trees down below? It's, they don't seem to be there. Maybe that's them over here, they've been moved. What does dominate, though, is this pagoda, this tower. I have detailed that. Here. And down below, we have evidence of 
a, a village of some sort. And that's down here. By the way, I don't have a detail. Our broad brimmed hatted mule rider is down over here. <laughs> Here's a detail of the tower here. So a temple of some sort. It could be a Buddhist temple. All along the vertical. What's interesting is that if you drew a horizontal line and a vertical line, the tower itself is right at the intersection of the two. And so it, although it's small, it uh, obtains great prominence. One more, and this is a, one of the great masterpieces that survived from the 10th and 11th century landscape painting tradition. This is by Fan Quan. I don't know too much about Fan Quan. The painting has been called Travelers Amid Streams and Mountains based upon a, a title of the painting associated with its name in a later historical record. So whether this is actually that painting or not, we never, we'll never be certain. It's a little different from the others, but we do have definitely a dominant mountain in the middle. That's really quite clear. We have rock forms below, the rock of Gibraltar-like shape. Um, there are people here. This guy's leading a mule team, and he's right over there. And then there is a close-up view. You can see how close this detail is. You can see the, the weave of the silk. There's also a tear or crack right through the rear end of the mule team. This is the guy who's the caboose of the mule team, holding a nice fan. Seems to be warm, maybe. Great deal of descriptive detail in the rendering of the goods and uh, being carried by these mules. I mean, if you're interested in one of the things that's going on in this period of Chinese history is this burgeoning, uh, this mushrooming of mercantile economies, uh, you know, using, you know, using of, of cash, uh, trade and goods. So the emphasis on goods and also trade and merchants traveling, it could be part of what's happening and what's showing up in these paintings. Uh, this is signature. <coughs> if you could see it, it's right over here. And uh, the two smashed insects oh. there, fun, fun. Details of streams cascade, cascading over rocks and underneath a rickety bridge. I mean, it's not so rickety, but a you know, rustic sort of bridge. A close-up view of it. And zigzagging forms, mm. and these boulders which becomes a common rhythm in this particular painting, how the forms zigzag in a much more rectangular, rectilinear fashion. Uh, there are fa our fancy palatial buildings They're right here. <coughs> Divide the painting along the central axis, maybe more closed here on the right side again, a little bit more open on the left side. Now, we don't define the painting in the top and bottom halves. This is a variation. And it's used, I think, for dramatic purposes to dramatize the scale of this mountain peak. Um, the forms in the lower part of the painting, oh, here, by the way, this is where our tree is. The cluster of trees down below have been replaced by a cluster of boulders, dead center at the bottom of the painting. But there is a prominent tree, tiny, but nevertheless, given the aura of luminous mist behind it, and also its location along the for the intersection of the horizontal and the vertical, it has a great deal of prominence, this little pine tree. So one wonders what it means, but we don't really know. Now if I gray out the top two-thirds, the bottom third has these forms that are basically horizontal, and there's a kind of kinetic energy, visual energy, that's bouncing off um, between and among these more horizontal forms. And then what happens is that there's a sense, and this is classic sort of in the formal handle and treatment of shapes and lines in Chinese painting, in Chinese art in general, is they're creating a great deal of energy that's built up and is compressed and so that when you get to the point where this mist is embracing the bottom of the tall summit and the pine tree that's there, it, everything goes vertical um, and everything goes out so that this is as if this mountain peak is large by virtue of this rocket-like shooting up from the compressed energy of the horizontal forms at the bottom. There's also a kind of movement and perspective and point of view, so that when you're looking straight at where the horizontal line we imagine, we imagine it to be when it's looking straight on, when you look up to the summit, you're actually, your point of view is you shifted down. And then when you're looking down at the rocks below, you're looking down from up above. So this is kind of like the emergence of what's in cliche called the shifting point of view in Chinese painting. So we have a shifting point of view up and down, so that you're not stationary. When you look down, you move up. When you look up, you move down. But when you're looking directly at the horizontal, you're looking straight on. Um, this becomes standard procedure also. Um, now, so here's our vertical. Again, now the forms on the left side look up towards the summit, and the forms on the right side look up towards the summit. But also from the summit, the forms are moving up and out. And this is also 
not unusual. Uh, all right, now, the last slide for this painting are the trees. And talk about patterns. So I've given you some sense of compositional devices, certain motifs that show up, um, certain structures that show up. And I don't think this is conscious at all. This is how one is trained um, in this tradition of painting. I mean, again, think about a musician who starts when he or she is young and you, you master this. You don't necessarily know why you do what you do when you're performing. Uh, maybe later on as you grow, you, you, you reflect on it more. Maybe you can understand why, but basically you're doing it. And I think that's how we want to understand how these structures appear. It's a mastery of some of these patterns, but on a kind of level of intuitive embodiment through uh, a lifetime of reiteration and practice. So that happens with the brushwork. And brushwork becomes really crucial and consciously crucial in the aesthetics of Chinese painting. And it gets to the point, um, there, there's this powerful assertion that's repeated over and over again from the 11th century on, that the brushwork in calligraphy is the same as the brushwork in painting. And I think that's important because the brushwork is crucial because the brushwork is also itself a mastery of a certain kind of pattern. And this pattern embodies and brings to life a certain kind of rhythm. And I think that's going to be key, pattern and rhythm. So it's also variations of the pattern. It's improvisation of the pattern. So when we look at the brushwork here, the contours of these tree trunks, if you look at this side, you notice they're kind of thick. Always on this side, they're sort of thinner. There are slight nuances of difference where these three trees are different trees. If you look at this, it's a bit spongy. This is spongy, but thicker. Um, a little bit more rectilinear, whereas these seem to be a little bit closer. We have, like, like we have two families of different sorts of brushwork, but ultimately it's the same kind of brushwork, but varied. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. In these paintings, there's very, there are very few kinds of brush techniques that are used, but you simply vary them, and then you can get the same brushwork is used to outline rocks, or the shore, um, or these distant contours of distant uh, cliffs. It's the same brushwork, but it's very, it lives in a different context, and a tree trunk, as opposed to this top side of the left side, right side of this mountain peak. In the different contexts, they have different meanings. There's a different kind of rhythmic responsiveness to the handling of the brush, so that now we're looking at trees as opposed to rocks. In other words, if I just abstracted a section of this, if I just took that out and I showed it, it says, okay, this is an exam, guys. What is this from? You know, it's a rock. Oh, no, it's a tree trunk. Um, so, all right. Now, this painting, Iwashi's Early Spring, uh, excuse me, 2000, um, one of the major masterworks that survives from 11th century Chinese landscape painting tradition. We know a fair amount about Iwashi. We don't know his exact dates. He ends up, the reason we do is because he ends up painting for his emperor, the Shenzong emperor during the 11th century. Um, and we have records of projects that he did. We don't have the paintings that survived. He did mural-sized landscapes. Um, there are even anecdotes about the way he painted. Uh, there's a story about uh, a, a new building that has been finished, and the interior walls have been roughly plastered over, and the plaster is about getting ready to put a layer of fine plaster so that he can paint. He's commissioned to paint landscapes on these walls. After the rough plaster is dried, he says, don't put on the fine plaster. And he takes rags and dips them in ink wash, and he rubs the rags over the rough plaster surface, and then begins to improvise landscapes. And the recorder of this, the writer of the anecdote says, before your very eyes magically, mists <laughs> and cliffs and streams and waterfalls. And, you know, um, so it's that kind of uh, technique. He's, he's, he's got. He's a master of the techniques. He's a master of what we call loosely the tradition, this whole vocabulary, this whole syntax of patterns. And so that, no, I'm going to improvise. And he can't improvise uh, uh, the frottage and the walls. So in this painting, 1072, it's titled Early Spring. The title is on the painting. The date is on the painting, 1072. And it has a signature. Well, signatures are easily faked. Um, Lots of people in the painting. In the lower left-hand corner, there's a pair of women with children so here. And they're headed home. So let's zoom in. There they are. She's carrying goods. She's got an infant. There's a toddler here, a fishing pole maybe, and then a family dog. Maybe they just disembarked. And this is home in the mountains. These two guys with the big hats are way over here. You see close-up detail. This is the weave of the silk. Um, this young guy pulling a boat is in the lower right-hand corner, and there's a gentleman over here shoring up his net. 
purpose of feeding them. This fellow turning around to catch a bit of a conversation on a bridge right over here. I'm oh, sorry, this, some of these are just pretty nice. And he's looking at these two folks in conversation. This guy's likely, if this is a beard, and this is a hat, then this guy is likely a foreigner. Um, there's our habit guy on his mule. And these are pretty nuts, right? So, viewing pavilions, so the idea of gazing at mountains is also a theme in these landscapes. And by the way, you can still see barrel stools in China, right? Um, on the right side there, and tucked away in this gorge, oh, a, there is originally a bit of color that survives from the painting, otherwise it's pretty much monochromatic ink on silk. Uh, really fancy buildings. Ah, the vision of the painting, left and right halves are more densely packed. Part is right in the middle of the right half, more vertical forms. Um, the open side is on the left with more horizontal forms. It opens up to the valley. You can divide the painting into top and bottom halves. Um, this painting somehow wants me to divide into a nine square grid, but you know, I don't know. Um, there are all kinds of possible associations with a nine square grid. Mythological China, its origins had nine provinces. Uh, the Confucian well field system, which uses a, you know, the character for well as a tic tac toe shape, you know, you know, all this stuff. And so I want to read this into the painting. I don't know. Maybe I'm just over interpreting. Um, yeah, same sort of thing. It's a shifting point of view. Looking directly at the center, we're looking horizontally. Um, we're level with the painting. When we look up, we actually, our, our point of view is actually shifted down. And then when we look down, we're actually looking from up above. So our, our point of view is shifting up and down the central axis in the painting. So, um, I know. Now, trees down at the bottom, there are two major tall, you know, it's early spring, right? Waking up in the dormancy of winter is part of the idea here. So we have these pine trees that are, uh, look like they've been and then they're more abundant, actually. And then we have a bent tree that's way over here, a really gnarly bent tree, so that fits kind of the parameters of the practice. And then way at the top, opposite the pine trees down here at the bottom, there they are, close to the view of it, as the summit. And the inscription that you see there is, doesn't belong. So Gosti signed the painting, put a seal on it, gave the title, but this is an 18th century inscription. And by the way, the big red seal is his seal. Yeah. Yeah. He loved Chen Long's taste in art was big and garish. Um, <coughs> now, on the left side is where we find the signature. If you look carefully, there it is, in black and white. So this is Guo Xi's seal, this is the title, Zhao Hun, and this is the date equivalent in the Western calendar of 1072. And where's his signature? It's partly effaced here. Guo Xi and character is pink, painted by Guo Xi. Uh, our buildings on the right side. So we actually move into the painting to the left and then come out the right side. Now, rhythm. Rhythm, I start to throw that idea. These patterns are actually about rhythm. And the brushwork is really about rhythm. So when we look at the detail, just one example of this, we look at these two pair of trees in the small detail, which you see right here, and towards the center of the painting. Uh, they're, they, they, we can see them in terms of a playful kind of S-shaped rhythm. So I usually start with this tree when I talk about it. It's rising up out of this rocky soil in a rather dense arc, and then it straightens out. So there's a change in tempo and energy. So it's tense here, and that keeps the momentum and tension here. Visual tension here keeps the momentum going up through the knot hole up here, and then it juts to the left, almost at a 90 degree angle, and then it turns clockwise to the right. So we go counterclockwise, jutting to the left, and then clock, counter, uh, clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise. It's an S shape. This S shape is, is, is constant in variations throughout um, this painting, but also in a lot of other paintings, but also through a lot of the history of Chinese art, and going all the way back to the Bronze Age. The tree behind, almost in response, um, grows in, out of the rocky soil in a, in a tense arc down here, but it's much more thick and, and crusty. Oh, you grew a knot hole, I'm going to grow a knot hole. You went up and then turned 90 degrees, I'm going to go up and sort of in tandem go 90 degrees. Not quite 90 degrees. I'm going to actually turn. You went clockwise, I'm going to go clockwise. I'm going to turn my 90 degree angle in clockwise, and then I'm going to grow another uh, counterclockwise branch. Oh, okay, well, you're going to do that, and I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to go zigzag, S shape, and disappear into the mist. Okay, well, I'll go with you. <laughs> right? It, I'm being facetious, but basically, there's this kind of rhythmic interaction 
of between these two trees, and they, they're understood to play off of each other in this way. And every form in this painting does that. All right, now, there's another, another way in which you get this kind of alternating rhythm. It's not sort of this tit-for-tat kind of sense of counterclockwise, clockwise movement. And that's light and dark, the encounter between light and dark. So I'm just going to zoom in on this detail of the gorge here where the temple buildings are. And look at this blue shape here for a moment. This is a ridge. And so if you look at the light side of the ridge, it projects. Um, and that would be sort of classical European modeling, you know, the high light projects and the, the dark parts recede, and that would be classical modeling. But the problem with this is that if you then change your point of view and look at the dark area, it projects and the light area recedes. And said, no, 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 that's not that's the way it's supposed to work. Um, here we have this kind of alternating pulse and the shifting between what is foregrounded. Um, and it goes back and forth and back and forth. And, and brushwork works that way. There are no brush lines that actually create borders. There are no brush lines that create, in a sense, delineation. But rather, brush stroke, when it's at its darkest, creates edges. And the edges are where light areas meet dark areas. And wherever you have a light area meeting a dark area, in this painting you get this kind of, we call technically figure ground alternation and ambivalence across when you shift your point of view. Again, shifting your point of view changes the space. It changes the meaning of the space. Um, but then but follow, follow the line and we have this basically S shape. So on the dark side, we have the S shape. On the light side, we have this S shape. Mm -hmm. Now, we go to course close to the center, and we look at the paint. The mountain itself begins following our S shape. The whole mountain is this serpentine S shape. As is, and, and along this, it's as if this whole mountain world is turning uh, on its axis. So we go into space. The momentum is such that we go into the, the valley space, and then we get spit out on the right side. I'm going around and around this great S shape, which is the momentum of the mountain rising up from the water and realm of the earth below. When we look at this detail up here on the right side, there's an S shape here, and then also, right here. Um, this, 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 this little detail here, I'm going to focus on this. And this is something that I saw. Now, these two figures, these, now you've seen all the figures in this painting, are right here, they're climbing up this ridge. And I want to focus on this spot here, just to really zoom in on the smallest details of the painting. And when we do that, if you follow the arrows, we get this kind of zigzagging motion, roughly zigzagging motion. This is what I'm trying to alternate with the red arrows and yellow arrows. This is the tiniest movement of the tip of the brush, zigzagging. But the impulse is informed by an intuition about the actual experience of what a ridge looks like or what rock feels like. It's not just sort of an arbitrary, abstract kind of rhythmic movement, but rather it's responds, the rhythm is responding to trying to, uh, to be descriptive about you know, rocky textures, uh, the projection of a ridge, the protrusion of a ridge. Now, not only do we have kind of linear zigzagging movement, which one could parse out again in this kind of S shape, is there's an up and down movement. There's a rhythm that's created by thickness. This is thick, and it gets thin here, and it's thick here, and it thins out. So it's a pulse created by this alternation of thick and thin movements, which is actually Guoshi very, in a very small moment, minuscule movements of the tip of the brush up and down. You push down on the tip of the brush, ink flows. If you lift up, ink doesn't flow. So that's what's going on here. So not only is this brush moving instinctively, zigzag, it's also going up, up and down, up and down as he's moving the, the tip of the brush. Now when we zoom out, we go left, we go right, we go left, we go right. So what I just find is, that, well, there's an S shape through this, but there are actually two. But the, each little movement is also this kind of rhythm of alternation. And also, um, although this slide is a little bit too pale, this is a darker area, this is a lighter area, so we're getting the kind of alternation of looking at the dark area, whether it's shifting our point of view across this meeting place of light and dark, we're going to get this pulsation this pulsating rhythm of figuring ground relationships. Um, so we have here this double S shape there, but there's also a double S shape here. And then remember the trees that we analyzed here before. And there's, there's S shapes there. And then so we have this resonance, like a wave-like pulse, in a kind of a correlation and correspondence rhythmically uh, between and among these forms. Ah, well, there's also a sense in which things are turning, because this is a point in which we're moving from the lower part of the painting of the trees up through the middle, and the middle sending us off into the valley. So there's a kind of momentum that's turning. Um, these forms seem to be turning in a counterclockwise direction. So where is this? 
well, you know, this is what, you know, um, David Roy and Anderson should have. Well, I've seen it in and on there listening to you talk. Well, I don't know whether it's conscious or not. I'm more familiar with this particular example, but if you look at this reverse S curve between Yang and Yin, and, and what Yang and Yin are, are the Taiji, this, 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 uh, the supreme ultimate in awkward English translation, which I will say you know, reminds me of high octane gasoline. So, so, um, taiji, supreme ultimate. But basically, not really properly called the symbol of yin and yang, it's really properly called. And, and this was a subject of intense discourse during this period of the emergence of Chinese landscaping, which is in the 10th and 11th century. So if you're interested in neo Confucian philosophical thinking, you know, there's a lot of stuff about this, this image and discussion about its significance. Uh, and its significance for government, basically. So the Supreme Ultimate is, the, in a sense, is a diagram, a graphing out of, 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 a, of a kind of a dynamic impulse that is at the core of everything happening. So it's, it's the happening of the world. And the happening of the world is a transaction that takes place between two points of view. Because yin and yang are not really ontological entities, but they're points of view. Their inclinations, their dispositions, and within each situation, those two points of view, those two in dispositions, exist in our interaction. And it's the interaction and the mutuality of these dispositions that creates things. It creates newness. It creates something. Um, so yin and yang are inherently different, but they're uh, but but there's, there's what Peter's talking about with respect to diversity, a relational kind of quality. Yin and Yang actually are the expression of that and understanding that the entire world, both human and natural, operates this way, ideally it operates this way. Right. So, so in other words, the, the rhythm of the brushwork in Guoxi's painting is this. It's an expression of this. It's, to what extent it's conscious. He paints for the emperor, so the emperor is identified with this power, so maybe it is conscious and maybe it's part of the political ideology um, that he's living in. We don't have the documents to say definitively. Now, yin and yang has this exchange of, this rhythmic exchange of points of view that creates novelty, works in calligraphy. And uh, so this is where we're starting to get to this, the realm of the term for culture. If you look at this, is an ink rubbing of a stone engraving of a famous piece of calligraphy. So it's quite dramatic. I like the slide because it's a quite dramatic demonstration of calligraphy. But it's carved in stone, so it's ink on paper. Now, in a sense, uh, there's a dynamic to the, dis to the situation one finds one, and in a sense, for the, the calligrapher who's going to begin to write, what that sort of that, that, that demand coming out that's emerging in a particular situation is the blank sheet of paper, you know, that, or, or what needs to be written, or why he's writing a poem, or whatnot. And so that's, that's, in a sense, the, the seed that is going to grow something. Then, in response to the seed, the seed grows, he makes this brushstroke. The first brushstroke is this dot, right? So now it's a, now a new situation. His response to the previous situation is to do this dot. Now we have a new situation. So this is going to bear fruit by producing the particular manner of rendering this brushstroke, which is the next brushstroke. Then now we have two brushstrokes. And now we have a new situation. And you have to respond to that. Ah, that's this brushstroke. So, what I'm getting at is that one of the terms in a, um, actually, in Jing Hao, the, the landscape painting that I showed you first, is recorded to have uh, written as kind of a, a story, and uh, it's about sort of principles of landscape painting. And in the story, one of the terms he uses that an old man, a sage, is teaching a farmer about paintings, and he uses two metaphors fruit and seed, or uh, sorry, sorry, it's, it's fruit and seed and flower. Fruit and seed and flower. Um, which has sometimes been translated uh, in its 1970s translations as the fruit and seed is the inner reality and the flower is the outer form. I tend to read fruit and seed as, and flower as being not in that kind of inner, outer ontological relationship, but their circular relationship. Because I'll ask my students, it's okay, so where's the flower come from? You know, the fruit has the seed and the seed falls and maybe it germinates and it produces a plant, the plant grows and it produces flower. Ah, okay, but then the flower actually gets pollinated maybe and then it produces fruit and produces seeds, it's a cycle. So that's what that's what's going on here. Right? And so the the seed is, you know, in a way of saying this is the beginning, a beginning, not the beginning, and that's to produce some kind of fruit. Uh, the fruit is the stroke. 
But now that's now becoming the seed. That's got to be that's demanding another response. And then the actualization of that response creates another seed. And then the response becomes the flower. But the flower creates another seed. And we go into the cycle, and this is, I think, one way that we can help ourselves understand what yin and yang in Taiji is about. It's this kind of transaction that happens that bears fruit, but the fruit is also a seed, and it keeps going and keeps going. So when it comes to this, that's what I think this is about. When? Hua, culture. The patterns that I'm talking about is that fall on this side. The transaction, though, is open-ended. What actually happens? That's the hua part, the transformation part. Um, and Chinese art texts will say, you can't just copy what happened before. You, you, that's pedagogical. But you're, you're different from everybody else, and your situation is always different from other people's situation. And your situation now is different from what it was before. So you can't do the same thing. And it's not possible for you to do the same thing, but it's also you shouldn't do the same thing. It's not the point. The point is the hua part, the transformation. And the transformation emerges out of this, the seed that bears fruit to the transformation, but the transformation produces a form. And that form maybe is a very powerful form, and that form then gets somehow sacrosanct and becomes part of the tradition of what other painters will study later on. So culture, right? It's like, and, and in China, the brush stroke pre-modern China becomes so understood this way, so powerful. It, it's identified with ancient sages. And, and so I say sacrosanct. Um, and so that, you know, it's an authoritative rhythm. To the point where a lot of Chinese history of Chinese painting is really conservative and boring. But then you've got these people who, just as my advisor used to say, kick the tradition in the butt once in a while. And, you know, push a little bit. They're, a little, they're strange. They're not, they're not so conservative. And so they change things. Legendary founders of writing and painting, Song Jian had four eyes. He looks up to the patterns of the constellations. He sees the patterns of bird tracks on the ground. And ah, writing and painting. Right? It's writing and painting, this, in, the, in the legends of the, of the birth, of the origins of writing and painting, they, they emerge out of nature. But they're not given to human beings by nature. They emerge in a transaction between human beings and nature. The rhythm of that, the creative rhythm of that transaction realized by charismatic folks who have four eyes. <laughs> you know, and that, that's you know that's how that and the pattern then becomes almost like a powerful cultural incantation that you can't violate until you know Western oil painting comes in. Uh, there are other stories about it, like a, a, a horse a dragon horse coming out of the, of the Yellow River and having these diagrams on its back or a turtle and comes out of the, the Loire River that has these diagrams in the back. Um, so we get to um, culture um, I was talking about patterns and the improvisation of patterns as being a realization of community and relationships. This is how I think of a painting like this, is that the, the, the discourse in which we talk about it is a representation of some kind, a representation of Goshi's impression of mountains uh, through a tradition, or um, his, his own expression of what mountains are like instead of a reality of what mountains are. This is how Chinese painting has been talked about. It's not, because they're not real enough. Sure, you have landscape forms in Chinese, mountains that are resemble this, it comes out of a certain geological and topographical reality, but um, it's still not real, and they didn't paint real places. None of these places are real locations um, in the 10th and 11th century. At least none of those paintings survive or are recorded. Uh, well, I tend to think of them as like this. You know, So I ask my students, I show them something like this, and say, was this music? And first thing Paul says, yeah. I said, well, do you hear anything? No. I said, well, is this music? Well, then they get the idea, right? It's not really music until it's played. It's the possibility for music to happen. And there's a whole world of tradition that goes beyond it. It's a whole world of physical mastery and embodied kind of performative knowledge that goes into this. I also like it because it's a visually graphing out of rhythms, of, of, of something that's going to happen, a performance that's, that can happen in time. But it needs to be performed. And that's how I think of this as a painting. This is a graphing out of a particular kind of rhythm. It's a sacrosanct rhythm that's embodied in these patterns and in the brush and ink technique that's used. Um, but it has to be performed. It's performed and it's making by Guoxi, but Guoxi has now created a seed, and now we have to come and bear, the seeds could bear fruit in our physical responses, but also in the conscious meanings that we, we, we come up with. Because the, our engagement with this creates meaning. 
and creating meaning, aesthetic meaning, experiences, literary meaning, that's culture. And, and that would be life. Now, folks who learn this share this. You, 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 particularly on the literate, the elite, literate culture. And Goshi wasn't actually part of that. In, in the traditions of his time, the literary elites are formulating their aesthetic. And for them, the brushwork that they're mastering, that they started learning when they were young, um, that they all share, and the texts that they all share in knowledge, or when they study them, um, become part of their physical personhood, it becomes part of who they are. And so the practice of culture is a shared practice. It's a communal practice. So when you're actually realizing calligraphy or realizing a landscape painting, you're actually contributing meaning, creating new meaning, contributing that meaning as a contributor and a participant to a community of people who share these same values. So nature, through this kind of painting, is culture and culture as a way of building and re or realizing uh, communal relationships. Just to show you and end with a few mountains, mm -hmm. to see what they look like. Quite amazing. Imagine hiking. <laughs> I, I spared you the pictures of, of Mount Hua where they're just basically three wooden planks, like two by fours that are just jammed <laughs> into the rock and they have metal chains. And you kind of hold on to the metal chains and go that way and you have a little cord that's attached to another thing that's hooked on to this. And you see these pictures of, of tourists there and you know, looking nervously holding on to this. <laughs> I should have brought this, but uh, yeah. It's good. This is uh, Huangshan in Hanwei Province. Mm. So it's pretty impressive. Oh, one, one thing about the, the, these mountains in China, the, the famous ones, um, don't imagine something like Mount Fuji or Mount Everest or uh, the Matterhorn. They're not really singular peaks mm. that stand up. They're actually confirmations or better yet, they're like families. Of, of ridges, cliffs, valleys, and peaks. So these are all, you know, these are all Wangshan. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>